Welcome everyone to our continuation of the Emerging Voices in Reese speaker series at Yale University. And before I introduce our esteemed speaker for today, I would like to first thank my partners for making this event possible. Doug Rogers, Marietta Bojevich, Jeannie Chu, Nina Magda, Christina Andriotis, and Asian Yupain. And I would also like to thank our sponsors for today, including Yale's program in Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures, and the European Studies Council at the Macmillan Center. And finally, I would also like to give a huge thanks to our speaker for today, Natalia Blackman, who is a PhD candidate at Princeton University in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures. Natalia's research is informed by performance studies and film studies, and she is interested more broadly in post-Soviet culture, cinema, theater, and digital media. Her dissertation, Human Documents on Stage and Screen, excuse me, Human Documents on Screen and Stage, a Contrapuntal Reading of Post-Soviet Documentary, explores documentary films and theatrical productions in Russia in the 1990s uh, through the 2010s. Her talk today is titled The Not-So-Lonely Human Voice, Sound in Contemporary Russian Documentary Theater, and approaches to contemporary documentary theater in Russia through an examination of sound and voice. So let's give a massive virtual welcome to Natalia and take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Spencer, for the introduction. And I would, uh, I would like to extend my gratitude to the Emerging Voices and Rees Committee for the invitation to join this series. I would like to thank Marietta Bozovic, Jeannie Chu, Mina Magda, and Douglas Rogers. I would also like to thank Christina Andriotis, who is running this event behind the scenes. It is a pleasure and a privilege to speak in this series after such an outstanding line of speakers. I'm so grateful and I have learned so much from you this season. So today, let me share my screen with you. I will be speaking about Russian documentary theater and specifically about document-based productions staged in recent few years in Moscow. I will share two case studies with you, documentary productions directed by Yuri Pogrivnichka and Andrei Stadnikov in Moscow in the 2010s. In my talk today, I approach contemporary documentary theater in Russia primarily through examination of sound. My analysis privileges sound as a structural element of a documentary work taking as a point of departure the emphasize importance of a sounding voice in documentary theater. In documentary theater, which usually engages with themes of high political, social, and ideological resonance, it is the sounding voice of actors that occupies front stage, either by means of reenactment and embodiment, or using techniques of estrangement, or even by projecting recorded interviews and testimonies, Documentary theater relies on multiplicity of human voices in order to produce the reality effect that it seeks. To create an opening for a more complex understanding of documentary and shift the emphasis away from giving a voice to the voiceless as the dominant modus operandi of the genre, I suggest an alternative concept, voice leading. I argue that voice leading operates at the level of sonic organization and composition of documentary works and affects the audience's perception of the documentary as a representation of the real. Documentary across media aspires to give a voice to the voiceless and is often envisioned as a vehicle for criticism, education, and change. Contemporary documentary theater in Russia is preoccupied with painful and pressing social issues without sensationalizing them but exposing a lack of public discourse and action around these issues. A kind of urgent necessity to construct narratives about dehumanization of uh, migrant workers, oppression of LGBTQ people, homelessness, disability, in such a way as to be legible and accessible to mass audience is tied to aesthetic choices made by contemporary Russian theater directors. However, However, following the recent critical intervention by the media and film scholar Pooja Rangan 
in her book, Immediations, the Humanitarian Impulse and Documentary, I would like to question whether the guiding principle of voice giving in documentary is indeed not flawed. Rangan discusses specifically participatory documentary in, in which voice giving presents itself not only metaphorically as visibility and empowerment of the underrepresented, but also quite literally in the gesture of giving the camera over to the subjects of the documentary. Rangan shows in her analysis that documentary, especially in its most benevolent humanitarian guises, is thoroughly implicated in the work of regulating what does and does not count as human. She problematizes the implicit logocentrism instrumental for the mission of documentary voice giving. Participatory documentary film perhaps exemplifies this problem in the most effective manner. But one can see the same ethical and philosophical ambiguity at work across a plethora of documentary genres, not exclusively in cinema. I borrow the term voice leading from a theoretical vocabulary developed in musicology to describe a practice of music composition that includes combining of several concurrent melodies so that they cohere perceptually. In the words of the scholar of music and music cognition, David Huron, voice leading is a codified practice that helps musicians craft simultaneous musical lines so that each line retains its perceptual independence for an enculturated listener. Certainly, I do not assume that the process of translation of musicological theory into the field of theater studies is a seamless one. However, I see a number of insights that voice leading offers when we approach complicated sound organization of documentary theatrical productions. For instance, music as well as theater is a dynamic phenomenon that takes time. It exists only temporally. Voice leading is connected to the idea of sustaining the continuity effect in music. That is what we perceive as a coherent sound has no actual physical reality to it. It is solely a construct of our auditory perception. In other words, it is the subjective image of a sound activity continuing over time. Keeping in mind voice leading as a technique that provides a roadmap, so to say, for our perception out of auditory confusion and towards a sense of connectedness, I argue that documentary theatrical productions actively employ voice leading as means to organize their sound and visual streams to produce the effect not only of sonic but overall continuity. When it comes to sound composition, documentary theater privileges counterpoint as one of the key elements. Edward Said, who coined contrapuntal reading as a term and productively applied musicological methodology to literature and culture analysis at large, writes, the essence of counterpoint is simultaneity of voices, preternatural control of resources, apparently endless inventiveness. In counterpoint, a melody is always in the process of being repeated by one or another voice. The result is horizontal rather than vertical music. In what follows, I suggest a contrapuntal reading of contemporary Russian documentary, whereby following independent voices, I examine complex structures of selected theatrical productions. This analysis highlights a kind of horizontality of these works, whereby means of voice leading, each of the individual lines or voices is developed in relation to each other, pushing against the idea of voice giving, which implies a certain hierarchy or vertical structure. I begin my analysis from the point of view of voice leading as a technique that first allows for integration of several simultaneous and perceptually independent lines, and second as a method of creating a coherent reality effect with two recent documentary theater productions from Russia. My first case study is Occupation is a Nice Affair, O Federico which is based on an autobiographical text by Tatiana Arlova. In the aftermath of World War II, she spent her childhood in East Germany occupied by the Soviet army, where her father, a Soviet officer, was stationed in the 1940s, 1950s. This production of the Okoladoma Stanislavskova Theater in Moscow 
uses not only a piece of documentary prose, not intentionally written for the theater, but also a documentary archival footage of the Soviet army in Germany at the time. Besides the monologue of the protagonist, who is identified simply as a woman, played by Lilia Zagorska, in the performance, Occupation is a Nice Affair includes several songs recorded as well as performed live on stage. I show how live and mediatized singing voices frame and weave through the performance and have not simply an ornamental but structural function. Occupation is a Nice Affair opens with a black and white documentary footage shown on an old style plain canvas screen elevated upstage. It shows Soviet army soldiers marching along a dirt road. They look tired. This is not a victory parade, but what looks like a middle of a long exhausting relocation of the troops. From the footage alone, it is impossible to tell whether it takes place in Germany or Russia and whether it is during or right after World War II. The stage is empty and dark. A song begins. After a short interlude dominated by violins and F minor key and a soft sounding rhythm section, a tenor sings, Once Upon a Time I Lived. It is a popular song written in the 1970s and performed by Alexander Gratsky, whose voice has such recognizable color to it and who is praised for a unique vocal range and a dramatic singing manner. When the screen goes dark and the light hits the stage after the end of the song, the audience sees a woman standing front stage, played by Lilia Zagorska. Her monologue begins. She says, when my mommy, my daddy and I arrived to occupy Germany and went out to town for a walk the next day, it seemed to me the Germans kept staring with curiosity and wanted to point fingers at me. No, Приехали оккупировать Германию и на другой день пошли гулять в город. Мне все казалось, немцы меня с любопытством рассматривают и хотят показать на меня пальцы. На мне были шаровары с начесом и резинки. Недавно по телевизору один дядька говорил, что в 50-е годы не было большого разрыва. Все люди жили примерно одинаково. The performance offers this dual opening with a male and a female voices. Both voices sing or speak about their past, memories of which are inextricably woven into the present moment. Zagorska's voice sounds soft, fragile. She looks like a grown woman dressed in absurd adult-sized post-war Soviet children's clothes. And accordingly, her voice sounds almost childlike even when she remembers how her adult son sent her away to a mental asylum, tired of dealing with a schizophrenic elderly mother. She never sings in the production, but actors wearing Soviet army uniforms, like her dad used to wear, take the stage throughout the performance to sing songs. Each of their appearances looks like a separate act, reminiscent of images from Soviet films about the war where such scenes of officers and soldiers singing were almost mandatory. The songs they sing do not all come from the 1940s. In one of the most memorable episodes of Occupation is a Nice Affair, the lieutenant, played by Alexander Kulakov, sings a song from the Soviet feature film, The Last Inch, Последний Duim, with a refrain, what do I care about all of you and what do you care about me? Песня из кинофильма «Последний дюйм».
this assemblage of documentary images, male voices recorded in live, men in military uniforms singing and dancing on stage, works together as the theater of the mind of the protagonist. There is no coherent chronology in her recollections. Excuse me. And therefore, it somehow makes sense for World War II Lieutenant to sing a song from the late 1950s. A sense of sonic harmony that this performance creates is rooted not in the contents of the songs, but in the musicality of Zagorska's speaking voice and male singing voices. Occupation is a nice affair ends with the same footage from the beginning of the performance. The screen shows a grainy documentary recording of Soviet soldiers marching along a dirt road somewhere, accompanied by, by Alexander Grodsky's powerful and moving singing. However, this time, the footage goes on to show the male actors who were on the stage just a moment ago, still wearing the same uniforms marching along the streets of Moscow. Descendants of the Sun, Patonki Sonsa, staged by the documentary theater workshop Teatr Truda in Moscow, also relies on a combination of a recorded footage on screen and actors on stage. Unlike Occupation is a Nice Affair, this performance does not include any music, just the sound of actors' voices. The weight of this performance is carried by the voices of five actors on stage, whose presence is basically reduced to their sounding bodies. There is no direct interaction between them and their movement across the stage is minimal. Descendants of the Sun brings together professional actors who deliver documentary texts and verbatim monologues, and non-professional actors who read fragments from literary works. In absence of music and sound effects, spectators are drawn to focus their attention on the voices, not only on what is being said, but how it is being said, on accent, pitch, tonality, what Roland Bard calls the grain of the voice. It is based on a montage of fragments from literary works that were part of the Soviet high school program, specifically Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. It also includes a short story by Platonov, which was published in the 1970s and which gives the performance its title. Other textual sources include Nikolai Bukharin's trial minutes and finally verbatim monologues of people who were born in the Soviet Union with the oldest person born in 1931 and the youngest born in May 1991. Descendants of the Sun is a theatrical study of what socialism meant and still means for different generations of people who outlived their country. With almost no set design, the minimalist space of the Sakharov Center stage in Moscow serves as a perfect location for this production. Besides five actors, there is a camera on stage filming the actors and projecting the footage onto a white plain wall. There is a kind of reduplication of everything the audience sees. However, even though the footage looks live, it is an illusion. And soon after the performance begins, an attentive spectator can start noticing slight and increasingly more apparent differences between the silent footage on the wall and the position of the actors on stage the movements of their lips as they pronounce their lines. As in the following fragment in which a non-professional actress delivers a monologue from Tolstoy's novel Resurrection. Думала, нащупывая левой рукой, 
на пол картины несомненно. Ему оставалось еще сделать мой мир. Он всегда делал эти продвижения перед долгим сидением заседания. Когда дверь дрогнула, кто-то хотел отворить ее. Председатель поспешно положил двери на место и отворил дверь. Извините, сказал он. В комнату вошел один из членов суда. Невысокий, в золотых очках, с поднятыми плечами и нахмуренным лицом. Опять Матвей Никитич и нет, сказал член суда недовольный. Нет еще, отвечал председатель. Лично опаздываю. The visual element is thus rendered almost superfluous. There's so much of it on stage and on the screen that the spectator is drawn to pay attention to precisely the gap between what they see and what they hear. Professional actors reenact verbatim monologues without either looking at each other or at the audience. They face the screen that shows photographs of people whose voices, manners of speaking, cadences, accents, they imitate. Everything is focused on the sound of their voices. In a particularly striking episode, the actress uh, Ksenia Arlova delivers a monologue of a woman, Vigina Gorbachova, who tells how her father, a Soviet army general, was arrested and executed in 1937. Her mother was sent to prison and she herself was sent to an orphanage. We hear the actress's voice speaking about the Soviet army general Konstantin Rakasovsky, who briefly served under her father. She says, Rakasovsky was a playboy, so to say. He would always kiss ladies' hands. What can I say, a Pole? He won the war, and then Stalin sent him away to Poland. For what? For what? There you have it, the power of the Soviets. I'm not going to talk about politics. I don't remember anything. During this monologue, we see a silent footage of this old woman on the screen. When the actress finishes the monologue, the screen shows the actual recording of the interview, and we can hear Regina Gorbachev's own voice saying the same exact lines. This episode is one of the kind in Descendants of the Sun, the only instance when the audience can hear and compare the voice of the person and the voice of the actor voicing their words. The actor's voices on stage in this production are not simply vehicles for the text the audience hears, but they organize, hold together, and move the performance forward. In the words of the scholar of sound and theater, Mladen Avadija, the immanence, fluidity, and sensuality of the human voice and the expressiveness of stage sound, traditionally considered secondary to the primacy of the text, 
are essential elements of the performativity and scenic dynamics that propel dramaturgy in contemporary theater. Although the fragments are connected thematically, it is a particular rhythmical and melodic structure of the vocal sound that plays a more important compositional role. The audience registers slight changes in the actors' voices as they transition from one person to the next. With these transitions, the spectator also becomes aware of what it is in this particular person's manner of speaking, tonality, accent, that is different. The performance guided by the musical voice leading principle teaches its audience to recognize these individual traces, almost in a way comparable to individual melodies. These voices are not to be given, but instead they actively shape the audience's perception and sharpen the spectator's acuteness when it comes to understanding the performance as an integrated whole and paying attention to the grain of the voice. Descendants of the Sun ends with an improvisational sound piece designed by the composer Dmitry Vlasik to be performed by the actors. In the performance finale, the screen shows a video of a country road shot from a distance with roadside grass and shrubbery occupying the bottom third and the sky occupying the top third of the screen space. White letters appear at random against the blue of the sky, spelling out words and fragments of phrases that we just heard voiced by the actors. As the video goes on, the actors place themselves around the audience in the dark and improvise a musical piece consisting of claps, whistles, humming sounds, as well as the sounds of friction of small metal spheres rotating in clay pots. The actors respond to each other's sounds and orchestrate the piece live by tuning into each other's voices. This anti-hierarchical sound composition mirrors the structure of the performance, where each fragment is related to the other one thematically with the theme, trial, justice, labor, socialism, etc., repeated and developed in an individual manner by the next speaker. It produces exactly kind of horizontal structure referred to by Said in his definition of counterpoint in music, as I cited earlier. In conclusion, voice leading rests upon the principles of harmony and counterpoint. It suggests, a, I suggest the reading of documentary theatrical productions that incorporate individual speaking and singing, mediatized and live voices, which allows for an understanding of an ethical work that these productions do, besides providing an analysis of their aesthetics. Voice leading here refers not only to a melodic structure for grounding counterpoint, but also to the way in which the sound of voices leads the performance and signifies agency. Documentary theater that so often presents itself as giving a voice to the voiceless, here replaces a hierarchy of narrative with a horizontal structure of repetition improvisation and response. Voice leading in music functions as a built-in teaching mechanism that allows for the listener to learn and quickly predict this, what sequence will follow. 
the listener's expectations develop along two pathways. A short term, expectations of a particular movement, progression, harmony, pitch within a certain musical piece. And a long term, expectations of a particular style of music recognizable as such within a particular set of cultural conventions. As Huron asserts, our schematic or long-term and veridical or short-term expectations rely on our accumulated exposure to a given musical style or culture. Accordingly, voice leading is strongly wedded to culture." End quote. The listeners knowing what might happen next musically is connected to a sense of purpose, movement, and continuity, which in its turn produces a sense of pleasure when the expectations are satisfied by the musical piece. In reading the works of contemporary Russian documentary theater counterpuntally, to borrow Said's formulation, in my presentation, I attempted to show how following the logic of voice leading, these works produce the effect of continuity for the spectator listener and a sense of pleasure as well. In these theatrical productions, regardless of their differences in style and ideology, the sounding voice functions similarly as a device allowing for the spectator listener to predict the development of the auditory and visual sequencing following the sound. The spectator listener develops veridical expectations based on the structure of each particular documentary and the audience's familiarity with the culture of Soviet and post-Soviet documentary in general produces schematic expectations. Here, we overwhelmingly find structures of counterpoint, intertwined individual lines, simultaneity of voices and repetition. Moreover, following Pujarangan's critique of the ethical aporia of giving a voice to the voiceless inherent in documentary, I hereby suggest voice leading as an ethically empowering mechanism offered by these documentary works. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Natalia. That was wonderful. So now I will uh, jump into some uh, some remarks and some questions. But before I do, I would like to remind the audience um, that if you have a question, we encourage you to use the Q and A function, um, and we'll uh, and we'll get to those. So thank you once again, Natalia. Um, your talk was was really fascinating, and I think it's. Uh, it, it's, it's not only an important intervention into theater, but also into how we think about documentary um, and sort of reveals some of the new spaces or different spaces that documentary can occupy um, that, that may not be so, uh, so um, immediate in, in other discourses. So your talk discusses two post-Soviet Moscow-based documentary plays, uh, Yuri Bogorovnich's Occupation as a Nice Affair and Andrei Stadnikov's Descendants of the Sun, that construct their documentary modes and ethical frameworks through what you call voice leading. That is the organization of these productions is based on sonic principles, such as tone, rhythm, etc. And this in turn creates internal continuity, produces a certain reality effect, and perhaps even more importantly, establishes emotional and perceptual connections with audiences that affect, on the one hand, pleasurable experiences, and on the other, or perhaps related, new forms of knowledge production. And significantly, in contradistinction to the idea that documentary works should give voice to the voiceless, a conceit that inherently favors a vertical relationship between the documenter and the documented, you offer voice leading as an alternative, perhaps more democratic or horizontal, contrapuntal approach to documentary that serves to empower rather than to subject. And so I think one of the, uh, the, the really key uh, statements you're making here is sort of questioning how an artist or director or a theater company uh, creates art that represents marginalized categories of experience without recirculating dominant hegemonic power structures that are inherent to the vertical documentary mode that you mentioned earlier. And so, and if that's like not a fair uh, uh, summation of your project, please tell me. Um, and so I could I'll, not have said it better. Thank you for this really great, <laughs> concise great. and uh, very well articulated summary. Great. And so of my so, presentation today. And so I have some questions then, um, slash thoughts. So uh, 
I, I'll, I'll offer a few uh, to start out and then, then uh, feel free to answer or not answer any of those and then we'll turn over to the to the q a um so my first question is uh something that i sort of uh, hinted at earlier and it's the question of genre or perhaps mode um specifically what does the term documentary signify in the context of these voice leading theatrical productions does documentary theater presuppose an ontological condition that necessarily involves the presence of indexical signifiers that is the, the sort of uh, the presence of these sort of uh, real ephemera and whether or not it does uh, how do we understand the relationship between the methods of representation including uh, live and pre-recorded song improvisational music circles the use of archival footage of uh, late or post-war europe uh, the exact sort of context of the, that is unclear, um, which I think is super interesting. Now, the staging of monologues with the pre-recorded versions of those same monologues screened behind the actors, and among uh, a number of other things. So, how do these methods of representation? Um, uh, uh, how do we how do we understand these methods with their documentary subject? And it seems to me that that the documentary subject in these performances is not sort of a traditional documentary subject whatever that might mean. Again, a super problematic term um, that, that perhaps I should qualify, but I won't right now. Um, so, so, so it seems to me that the, the subject is perhaps something that is affective, intellectual, and ideological, therefore demanding non-traditional forms of documentation. And so I'm wondering if you could say a few more words about precisely what is being documented and why the forms adopted by these artists are necessary to document them. And why does theater seem to be uniquely poised to confront these specific, um, less traditional subjects? And then my second sort of big picture question uh, is uh, sort of related to this concept of voice leading that is so central to, to your project. And I'm wondering if voice leading can be maintained without its sonic qualities. Can voice leading be read or does it have to be heard? Um, and, and so how do, how do you approach scripting in, in this instance? Uh, does the voice maintain a singular status in producing meaning? And stemming from this, I'm wondering if the voice need necessarily be a human voice. Throughout your talk, you mentioned these other methods of sonic production. Um, I think most, most uh, interestingly, at the very end, the sort of improvisational musical circle. Um, is this a voiceless act or is this simply a different type of voice? Um, is the voice a biological attribute or is it, or is it more of a political thing um, or perhaps some com combination um, or, or, or not at all? And relatedly, my sort of third question is, I would like to hear more about the political implications of these projects. And uh, is, is, this, is, is there a politics that, that sort of grounds meaning making in rhythmic melodic structures? You mentioned that uh, Bakut Panichka and Stupnikov's plays take different ideological stances and stake their claims um, um, differently. So, so what are these? What are these ideological differences and, and these ideological claims? And, and how might they be read with or against one another? And why does voice leading work particularly well in, in these specific productions? And, and, and what is the sort of scene that surrounds these two specific productions? Are these um, representative or are these sort of uh, isolated incidents? And so I'll, I'll hold off for now um, and allow you to, 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 to pick up some of those. Well, thank you so much for, for these questions. I feel like each one of these questions is like worthy of its own, you know, separate research project. Uh, but of course, I, I engage with all of these larger questions in, in my larger project. So, uh, but I, I would want to start maybe with your um, with your last question and then you, you know move on to sort of like larger um, methodological I guess like bigger research questions related to documentary as a mode and documentary theater as a particular uh, art form that instrumentalizes documents and so speaking of political implications I think that um, it is really interesting for me to look at these two productions uh, uh, together because on the one hand they they both touch upon the questions of of memory and uh, how and sort of like the embodied memory of how memory carries uh, with the people through time and I think that um, 
when we think about uh, uh, Pogrebnichka's production, which is uh, occupation is a nice affair, it, the way that it stages the processes of mm, you know, production or recollection of memories about the war, it shows that it's an incredibly fragmentary and kind of, um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a linear clear cut narrative. And I think because it sort of kind of brings together all of these different resources, you know, visual and sonic and textual about, about the war, it kind of breaks or like pushes against a possibility of creating one clear cut sort of shared by everybody narrative about the war, about the occupation, about the, the aftermath of the war and it shows that actually individuals carry within themselves these assemblages of uh, various kinds of images and voices and you know memories are incredibly unreliable and in this way there is a kind of a push against this effort to uh, to present to present the war and memories of the war as something that can be sort of like organized and then delivered to the masses in a way that is quite clear cut and um, not ambiguous. So this is where I, I see this kind of important political work that it does, even though it doesn't sort of position itself as, you know, this is a piece of sort of like polemical, political, oppositional theater. But I think that as I tried to show the, the very shape that it takes and uh, how it is uh, presented to spectators does this kind of work of uh, kind of deconstruction of these clear cut um, sort of like um, one dimensional images. And I think that Tom um, Kisonsa, the descendants of the sun also does a similar yet slightly different work of also showing that we can't really we can't really present one image or one narrative of what post-socialist sort of Russians or Russia is because all of these different people, right? And all these different generations of people and the voices that are kind of transmitted through this production, they show again, you know, there are a hundred of different images of what it was, what it is, what people remember of you know, being in or being of uh, the Soviet Union and sort of the idea that we can now talk about socialism as a finished project that failed is also not something that this particular production uh, kind of supports, I think, right? It shows that there are all these different uh, recollections of it and kind of embodied experiences of it that are still there and that to reconcile with these sort of like multiplicity of voices is also kind of an incredible incredibly important political work um and i i really think that if you think about the kind of political work that these productions do they they do fit with the general sort of like stance of um, the majority of documentary theatrical productions in russia that always kind of position themselves as questioning or pushing against uh, more sort of like clear cut state sponsored uh, narratives er around all these all, all these issues. And I think that that's why I would say that voice leading and sort of like the attention to the voice is so important for these two productions because a voice is something that is individual, it is something that is embodied Right? It is something that is also very controversial because it, you know you can seem that you can guess so much if you just listen to a person's voice. And then how many times have we all been sort of like completely surprised right when we when we actually see see the person speaking or singing? And so there is this kind of uh, inherent kind of um, impossibility to just provide a finite answer to all these questions. Uh, so this would be my <laughs> my very long uh, and not very well articulated answer to your question about political implications of these productions. 
and then you offer these um, really interesting sort of uh, questions about um, about voice leading and how it uh, relates to say scripted narrative, right? And I think that uh, I think that it's it's a very interesting question, and I like think, to think about and to engage with uh, the auditory sonic uh, dimension of uh, of you know theater making, but also film, because I always I find that the the medium which is the voice in this case or you know the sound more generally speaking is oftentimes bypassed as if we have access to the meaning to the words to the narratives directly bypassing the very medium by which say in theater that you actually encounter right encounter the words you only you know like in most cases you don't read right you actually hear the words being spoken by particular voices. And then each of these voices has its own, you know, like um, various sonic dimensions. And I think that it's, it's interesting for me to actually look at that as, a, as an important structural element and to see what else can we, what else can we say about theatrical productions if we actually, yes, we pay attention to what is being said, but also, how it is being said, right? That, and how the sounding voice kind of resonate, resonates with uh, other sound uh, apparatus, right? That can, that can also be present in a production like with um, occupation, right? Where it's not only a sounding voice, but also you have musical instruments. You also have um, what is called, well, in, in cinema studies it's called shumi, right? But sort of like various, um, sort of like sound effects that they recreate on stage and how does voice come sort of like play into this orchestration of the sonic experience so yes I think that I, I think that it's it doesn't have like a separate standing but I think that uh, it's not as often sort of like discussed or talked about in its own right and I think that it's an incredibly interesting very rich uh, structural element to uh, to look at. And then, of course, the question of the questions, right? So sort of like, what, what do we mean when we say, you know, documentaries in general, and especially about uh, documentary production? Uh, you know, what, how do we, how do we measure this, right? What qualifies to, to, to be called a documentary production? And I think that in, in my work, I think it is important to to think of a document as a kind of material material carrier of traces of an event that happened in reality, that I think that um, sort of like one's, one person's memories of of an event is not a document, but if you have a recording, if you have uh, a written note, something that has this sort of material quality that that you know, that functions as this sort of indexical signifier, right? Even though it is not like a photograph, right? Or not a footage, but something that exists in reality as a material object. And then this material object might not even be shown, right? To, to the audience, but it is one of the cornerstones of productions. I feel like as is with, um, with occupation where they have, first of all, the text, which is, uh, you know, an autobiographical text that is based on the memories. And then the, the, the footage that I uh, showed, some of the fragments of it that they also bring into the performance, these, um, you know, documentary archival chronicles of, of the war. Um, so in, in this case, they kind of like just show them to you. And then in Descendants of the Sun, I think it's, um, it is interesting because you have, uh, for example, the, uh, a monologue, which is, um, uh, which is, which is the entirety of Bukharin's trials, uh, 
monologue. It's really long. <laughs> I wish I could show you all of it because it's, it's kind of like an incredible tour de force by uh, Sergei Karaban, the actor who delivers it. And uh, you think it's interesting because you it, it's, it works because you trust that this is the accurate representation of the notes, right? And uh, there's a lot of it. And I think for documentary production in general, in, across media, the question of whether there is this contract that the audience kind of agrees upon with the producers that they kind of invest in and trust that, that there is somewhere, you know, under all these sort of like aesthetic layers, there is a document that's kind of, um, that is a proof or the evidence that this is a documentary work. Thank you so much. I mean, that that sort of creates so many more new questions, um, but but I would love to uh, to, to field some, some questions from the audience. Um, if, if you have some, please throw them in the Q&A and uh, But uh, if not, I, I do have, I do have more questions to, to ask as well. Mm -hmm. So, I guess I'll go ahead and, and ask this question that, that is perhaps related to, um, to, to some of your the statements that you just made about, um, sort of, reconciling the sort of layers of documentary, um, sort of placing the aesthetic object over the sort of um, signifying indexical object. And, and this is the question of trauma and, and, and whether or not we have some sort of um, perhaps traumatic response. You, you identify all of these, or these two productions as specifically post-Soviet. And, and, and so I'm wondering if there's something uh, expressly uh, related to the, the, the political and cultural framework of the Soviet Union and its transformation into uh, both the Russian Federation and all the other um, uh, states of the former Soviet Union. So, so is there some sort of, uh, is this a uniquely post-Soviet framework uh, in the sense that it, is, that it is tied up with these political and cultural legacies of the former Soviet Union and, and any of its associated trauma that is then recast through these interpretive lenses that are often disjointed, cyclical, and recurring, <clears throat> excuse me. Mm -hmm. So, 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 what is the role of, of, of perhaps a uh, a trauma that is that is implicit in all of this? That is um, that is a good question. I think that uh, I think that there are are several sort of like several ways in which uh, post Soviet documentary, in this case, theater, is. Um, Sort of position it itself uh, against the the Soviet uh, legacy, and of course, uh, you know, documentary theater is not a post-Soviet invention. It uh, it 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 acquires a particular standing in the in, after the collapse of the Soviet Union with the sort of institutionalized support of uh, Theater Doc, which is you know, in the theater that is committed to production of documentary plays but in throughout the you know th throughout the soviet uh, history of theater and drama you have these experiments with uh, uh, with documentary productions and it's interesting that in a sense there is a desire to distance uh, you know like to, to, to distance from from this legacy and to uh, to present uh, post-Soviet documentary theater as uh, sort of like having, you know, say, outside of the of uh, Russia origins and influences, but I think that it's it is definitely at least there is some kind of a pushback or dialogue with the with the legacy of um, Soviet theater making there. I think that to think about this, I think that the traumatic. Uh, uh, traumatic element in these two productions probably is there. Uh, pr probably, sort of like, is a part is a part of uh, of the message. I would say, right, of these two productions. Um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't generalize, right, on onto 
the documentary theater in general and to say that all, all of it is in some way right <laughs> sort of like there's there's no post-soviet documentary theater without the traumatic experience of um, of the collapse of the country i think that uh, in in a sense uh, the probably the sentence of the sun is a more kind of like straightforward engagement with that because it is about socialism and it is about how how do people who outlive the, their own country who were born you know went to school in the Soviet Union and now they live in a very different reality but how they carry within themselves the narratives and the experiences that were informed by by socialism and living in, in the Soviet Union and uh, yes there there is sort of like this repeated uh, uh, like in the episode that I that I showed where she says, you know, I'm not gonna, I, I don't remember anything, right? Even though like she remembers really well and provides all these, you know, accounts of, you know, the meetings and everything, but then there is a desire to forget and as if, as if it never happened. And I think that that speaks to this sort of like traumatic erasure, right? Of, or the impossibility of, the impossibility to, to provide uh, a coherent narrative of something that is, that is traumatic. So in a sense, um, in in these different in these different monologues, you you hear the sort of like that exact articulation, which is one of the definitions of uh, of trauma. Uh, and the occupation is a nice affair. It's you, you have there the layering, right? The layering of trauma because it's not only that um, these these memoirs, right? The the, the text is uh, is written after the collapse of the Soviet Union, but also that may be a much larger traumatic uh, event that is the sort of like the foundation of of this um, production is the occupation is the experience of the war is the experience of kind of uh, displacement both in terms of you know be, being a part of the force that displaces other people and being yourself displaced and out of place so i think that uh, it uh, the kind of fragmentary and not and sort of like narratively not coherent nature of this production is is a kind of a testament to to that right and that's why I think that because it is so incoherent in terms of narrative and kind of there there's no plot not, or anything the sound and the voice becomes this force that that provides the structure and provides this kind of organizational points where everything can be tied. Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, I know we're running up on our time here, but we do have a, a couple of questions. I'll, I'll field them both to you and uh, feel free to maybe okay. offer some, some uh, a brief response. Um, so the first one is from Daria Filipova, who says, thank you, Natalia. I have a question about your research methodology. How do you select the productions you look at? How many productions um, is it important to see in order to co to come to a conclusion about what to say, uh, for instance, the function of sound. Uh, do you look outside of Moscow? And can you perhaps speak a little bit more about this process? And the, the second question is from Masha Schwolberg, who says, thank you for such a rich talk. I'm always heartened by more sound studies, uh, work being done in Slavic, and more attention to materiality in documentary studies. If there's time, I'd love to hear a little bit more about this mode of spectatorship that these works encourage? And do they encourage a sort of self-aware spectatorial position rather than an absorptive one? Are they relatively self-contained or do they open up to further works? Do they encourage further research on the viewer's part? Mm -hmm. Such great questions. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you both Daddy and Masha so much for questions. I think uh, that, yeah, the, the first question about methodology I, I think that I, it is, um, for, for me at least, it is not a question of how many productions I should watch within a particular sort of like period of time, because I do not aim to generalize, right? I think that I, I can, I don't think that I can responsibly offer um, sort of like an argument that would be so general as to cover all kinds of ways in which documentary theater exists uh, across the entire region. 
in the sort of like in the post-Soviet period, I think that um, what I try to do, I look for, you know, pr productions that I think are, you know, outstanding or interesting or, you know, symptomatic based on a number of uh, productions that I that I have seen. But of course, there's always this problem, which I think that all performance scholars uh, have to face is that, first of all, you have to, right, you have to be there to witness performances live because, it's, you know, even though I, I used recordings in my presentation today, but it is, you know, again, it's a mediatized, you know, recorded, documented version, which differs significantly from a number of times that I've seen those productions. So first of all, yes, it's a problem of access. And especially now that, you know, we've, we've all been kind of uh, denied access to, to, to live performances for almost a year. And so to performance scholars, it means that your, you know, your primary sources are always, always come, you know, already mediated by say video. And it doesn't mean that you cannot study and work with them like that, but it, you know, you have to sort of like reflect on the fact that this is not a live performance that you're writing on. So I try to do my best to see productions outside of Moscow and St. Petersburg. And there have been so many incredibly interesting uh, documentary productions. Just very recently in Novosibirsk, uh, there is a production that is um, directed by Anastasia Patlai. Um, there, there are documentary productions in Kazan, in Tomsk, and you know, if, if whenever it's possible, I, uh, I think that it is really important to, to, to not only sort of like st stay confined to Moscow and, uh, and then generalized. So again, right, like I, it, it is hard to generalize based only on sort of like Moscow theatrical culture about, about the entire country or the entire region. So I try not to, uh, not to do that in my work. And uh, for Masha's question about the kind of spectatorial experience uh, that these productions um, sort of like push the audience towards, um, I think that, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting because they affect you in a very different way. If I could, if I, um, if I could speak of sort of like my own experience of being present at the, or being, being a spectator at them. I think that um, the what 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 happens at the very end of Descendants of the Sun is that this musical piece that uh, is imp improvised by actors who are sort of like sitting around you in the dark and you can't see them anymore, it goes on for a really really long time, and then they just kind of disappear. So you don't have this final moment, you know, when you see the actors, uh, you know, and you clap and you know, here's the finale. You're sort of like completely lost in this like darkened space and you look around and there's nobody there and there's nobody for you to thank. And it creates this kind of an interesting effect where uh, it just sort of like you, you just sort of linger in the experience as a spectator. I think that uh, it definitely, I think it depends on, on a spectator and you know, we all react to what we see and what we hear very differently. I think they, it definitely sort of like shakes up a little bit any possibility of uh, having sort of like one solid, uh, so like hermetically closed interpretation of, um, of a production or a story or a memory. So I think that it definitely sort of like invites uh, this kind of introspection. And in both cases, I think it definitely encourages us, the audience to um, to be kind of like attuned to the musicality and the, the sound of, uh, of theater. Thank you. And thank you all for your wonderful questions. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. So once again, I, I invite a, a massive virtual round of applause for Natalia. Um, thank you again, Natalia, so much for, for your presentation today. And thank you all uh, for, for attending. Have a terrific rest of your week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Spencer. And thank you, Christina. And thank you, the wonderful audience. <laughs>